everything. Welcome to Anupar. It is wonderful to be with you for another program. On this evening's edition of Anupar, we are looking back at the many positive developments of the past week. Indeed, it has been a triumphant week for the people of Dhanme. I tell you always that this government, your government, is working. We're working for you, and we are working to secure a brighter future for your children. When we speak of dynamic Dominica, we mean to create a country full of the promise of economic growth and prosperity. It is a Dominica of greater opportunity, better infrastructure and housing, improved health and social services, and very importantly, more jobs. Every day, we actively seek to respond to your development needs. We do not sit idly by when the challenges we face as a nation, as a people, must be confronted. Rather, we are devising ways to create new avenues for advancement of each and every Dominica. On Monday, the government announced changes to the COVID-19 restrictions, which are guaranteed to spur activity and corresponding growth in the economy. Our people are excited to return fully to their day-to-day -day lives, to re-engage in social activity and conduct more regular business at their establishments. This is a shot in the arm our economy needed after two years of lockdowns and restrictions. As a people, we must now recommit to hard work and dedication to our various endeavors. I can say with absolute conviction that the government of Dominica has done its part to provide a sound base for our citizens to build on and achieve their dreams. I remind you now to take advantage of the various concessionary loan facilities made available for you to invest in business ventures, in building your homes, or in your education. And as I have mentioned before, we're moving full steam ahead with innovation in agriculture and agro-processing industries. We should open up even more opportunity for employment and entrepreneurship. We are taking major steps as a government which have significant implications for the economic fortunes of this country and for the very future of our children. Thursday, March 31st, was a momentous day for the Commonwealth of Dominica. We signed an agreement with Emera Caribbean Inc. to acquire 52% controlling interest in Dominic. As I said before, this corrects an historic ground. When in 1997, 72% of Dominic's shares were sold by the United States Party government for what was at the time considered to be a paltry sum of $21 million. The Dominic Legal Party government has always believed this was not the best move for the people of Dominica. And we have long expressed an interest in regaining the majority shares of Dominica and returning it to the people of Dominica. The purchase of Dominica holds many benefits for us as a people, as a country. I cautioned before that we will not immediately see the impact on electricity rates, but the long-term objective of this government is to ensure the company is profitable and that we are able to provide safe, reliable, and cost-effective energy to the people of Dominica. To do this, we will have to make strategic investments to improve output and strengthen our system against the constant threat of climate change impacts. All of this will be costly, but this government is committed to the creation of a resilient power grid for the generation, transmission, and distribution of affordable and sustainable energy. We will do this in conjunction with, with the development of a geothermal energy source in the Rosa Valley to reach our national target of 100% clean carbon neutral energy by the year 2030. The acquisition of Dominic falls right in line with our pursuit of this alternative energy source to improve our future prospects for energy independence. Once again, I thank Imero Caribbean Inc. for its nine years of productive operations in Dominica. We look forward to a successful transition in the coming days and weeks. I welcome every Dominican citizen to join hands 
as we build on our gains and work towards a dynamic Dominica together. This past week, Dominica achieved a significant milestone in our management of the COVID-19 pandemic. The government of Dominica announced the lifting of restrictions on social, religious, and other activity, which will come into effect on April 4, 2020. The revision of COVID-19 protocols and relaxation of restrictions will allow businesses to return to normal operations and serve as a boost to economic activity. We are, however, still intent on protecting public health and limiting the resurgence of COVID-19 cases. I've invited Honorable Dr. Irvin McIntyre, the Minister for Health, Wellness and New Health Investment, and Ms. Lisa Ballon, the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, International Transport and Maritime Initiatives, to speak with us about the new protocols and what they will mean for all of us. I take this opportunity to welcome them uh, to Anupali. Uh, Dr. Mark is not your first time here. You appear to have been a regular. Um, and of course, Ms. Swami, you've been here before. Yes, um, Anupali, so welcome. Happy to have you here. Um, we will certainly go straight into, into the program, into the questions, I think, that the, the, that the public would like um, some um, certain clarifications on and, and, and clear understanding of what we have done and what does it mean uh, in terms of what we have done. Now, Dr. McIntyre, we announced the, the changes to COVID-19 protocols and restrictions on Monday. Let's start by providing a summary to our listeners of the decisions taken by this government. Okay, good evening, Pierre, and good evening to our listeners. Um, well, this week, it was a really big week for us in the sense that we had to make certain adjustments to the SRO that we had related to COVID-19. And in summary, what we really did was to remove a lot of the restrictions. First thing, we can begin with the restrictions on religious um, gatherings, which initially was 150, but now we've got it down to. We've just removed 150 and they can function at full capacity. So no longer limitations of 150, but they can function at full capacity. Apart from that, in terms of public transportation, we have to we can now go back to full capacity. Initially, we had to we had a, a seat in between the occupied seats, but now we can go back to full capacity. Um, in terms of restriction and educational instruction, um, preschools and daycares, they can now open from tomorrow, the 4th of April. And um, we already have a blended approach for primary schools and secondary schools, but from the 25th of April, which is the third term, will be full face-to-face -face with all of the schools and even the other private educational institutions will fall in line with this regulation as well. In terms of bars, we had limitations on music and congregating. Now we remove those restrictions so music can be played and the congregation can continue um, at the bars. Nightclubs as well, but we have a limit to nightclubs in that if you were to go above 300, it would be classified as a special event. And we'd have to get permission because we have a task force that gives permission for these events. Even for sporting activities, less than 300, that is allowed. Above 300, it will become, it will be classified as a special event and we have protocol for those special events. And um, moving away from that, even social activities such as parties and, you know, personal um, functions and stuff. Above 300, you will need to have um, permit and you have to have special protocol. But below 300, that's perfectly fine. You remove restrictions on those as well. In terms of visiting, whether it's the prisons, whether it's the hospitals, because in the case of the hospitals, some of the inpatients may have a little issue with them. Like one day, family members were wrong and we had restrictions on those. So we've adjusted those, removed those, both for the, the benefit of the patients and just for their just general upkeep and their personal hygiene. We always look after family member along the hospital. So the institutions will have their specific protocols as to the relaxation of those. But we remove all of this. The mass mandate does remain in place. So, but we will review this in May and as time goes along. And in terms of all the businesses, the establishments, the churches, and the schools, um, they just have to conform to the protocols, physical distancing, they have to remove the physical distancing in supermarkets, etc. But all the other protocols will remain. So it's, uh, it's a significant amount of relaxation that we have. But tell us though, um, 
people are asking why is it still important all of the removal of the restrictions to keep the mass mandate okay well here the mass mandate is really just it's a simple way of preventing the transmission of the virus so granted we may have relaxed quite a few of the protocols but a simple way such as a mask to prevent transmission because who knows which other variant might come in we had the delta which was a very serious one lots of pneumonia it caused quite a bit of deaths luckily it was the only friendly virus wasn't that much but we never know what other variant can come any other variant of concern so it's really significant and important that we continue to wear a mask and we continue to apply and adhere to the simple protocols that are brought us where we are today and in your case i mean the way the mask certainly um, we may well become part of our, of our daily practices yes yeah because we did you saw the mask we, we also saw uh almost a non-existence of a flu though some people were hiding the flu but you know you're, you're very correct here actually with the mask we definitely saw a reduction in the amount of flu and um it's a cheap way of preventing transmission and um it's just a matter of personal responsibility you just have to get accustomed to it and just each one can for each other when the mask it not only protects you, but it also protects your other colleagues, your friends, your vulnerable parents at home. So it, it's a two-way thing. We just can't do a benefit by wearing our mask. We but, should continue. But for me personally, it wouldn't be on COVID-19. I, I believe that down the road, uh, we may need to look at the mandating the use of masks for food handlers, um, for restaurants and bars and, and this kind of thing. But, uh, that also prevents a lot of challenge. But it's something for another yes. time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mr. Bismarck, welcome again. Uh, can you remind us of, of, the, of the new measures uh, in place uh, for the tourism sector? Well, good evening, once again, Honorable Prime Minister and Honorable Minister for Health, Wellness, and Health Investment. Good evening, of course, to your listeners and viewers, and thank you again for inviting us to the program. And here, firstly, the removal of the requirement to submit to the pre travel um, health questionnaire form is one of the major changes in terms of the new protocols. As you know, prior to these um, revisions, all travelers were required to submit the pre-travel screening form, upload all the documents, and um, pay for the antigen test and await approval to come to the country. With these new requirements, um, this certainly easing a lot of the anxieties of travelers to the because it will be much more easier. All they need to do is work with their documents and make their way to the And so there will no longer be the need for waiting on an approval email to come to the country. Secondly, the removal of testing on arrival for all travelers. Again, this move will certainly ease anxieties, especially that anxiety uh, within those 20 minutes of waiting for your test results. Um, that enough was um, enough to deter persons from coming to Dominica, um, not to mention the requirement for quarantine. And so the removal of the five to seven day quarantine for unvaccinated travelers is certainly uh, a major change. For vaccinated travelers, the pre-travel test will no longer be required. So if you're vaccinated, all you need to do is grab your vaccination card, your passport and your ticket, and get to the airport to come to Dominica. If you're not vaccinated, you grab onto your valid test results, passport and ticket, and you'll be well on your way. And so this applies to if you're coming in by air or coming in by sea as well. For vaccinated crews, yes, um, they will now be able to disembark and enjoy Dominica freely. So all of these um, revised protocols really and truly aim to make traveling to Dominica much easier. Now, thank you. What safety measures must tourism service providers uh, continue to comply with? As the Honorable Minister for Health mentioned, um, the proper way of masks and of course sanitization um, remains a very important feature for the tourism sector. Our safety nature certification will still remain relevant as it um, assures visitors that their health and safety are priority and of course for the tourism service providers that their health is also important as they are. So, we've taken all these measures and so forth, obviously we have stakeholders um, with the tourism uh, industry. Um, what has been their response to how, how has how, how have they folks in the, in, in the industry uh, react to those to those measures and and is it anticipated that this will have a swift impact on activity uh, within the tourism sector yeah i think within the entire um, tourism sector as well as the entertainment industry we can i we can all breathe a collective sigh of relief as you know the dhta had done their own research and had submitted quite a few recommendations which had been reviewed and approved as part of our previous um 
protocols which were approved you know, earlier this year. So it is definitely welcomed by especially the accommodation sector, the dive sector, the tour operators. By Monday, we will see the daily direct flights from the US. So that certainly um, is very timely in that regard. And for the yachting sector, one of the most safest subsectors, it will really be a big change for them as many of their fish challenges in getting the antigen test on time. And even when they came to Dominica, the requirement for the quarantine. So it will certainly, uh, we certainly look forward to an increase in calls and of course increase in visitor arrivals and all that these restrictions are moved. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll <clears throat> the question is, how did we get here? Um, surely it is a reflection on our successful management of COVID-19 um, that we have in effect um, given now to, to reopen the country. Um, Dear Matthew, you are very correct because from the beginning of the pandemic, we never did things in a <clears throat> sort of half as a numerous continuous one. We were working according to a plan. And um, I believe in any pandemic, there's a plan as to how you manage a pandemic. So from scratch, in terms of the command and the control and the management, we had to see the university organizing committee. We also had a new meeting, if you remember. So all that is part of the plan that we followed as well. In terms of surveillance and laboratory diagnosis, which is part of the plan, our testing, we have testing on all over the country. And in terms of PCR capacity and capability, Remember, we're the only country in the Caribbean that has PCR capacity, apart from CAFO, which was in Trinidad. And um, so all that is part of the plan that helps us to get where we are. In terms of vaccines, vaccines is also part of the pandemic plan. We will first our vaccine in the Caribbean, and we actually will make the vaccine for some of our sister countries. And let alone that, we also set up a vaccination unit as well to carry out all the vaccines. A fourth part of our plan was actually the acquisition of individual antiviral medication. We will see that we make sure that we have all the medications to look after our patients and those who contracted COVID-19. Besides that, the plan also did the health system and the emergency response. If you see what we did in Portsmouth, we set up an entire unit the COVID care complex. We had all the staffing go down there. We set up the human resource, and that is part of the health emergency plan in terms of sustaining the health system during a pandemic. In terms of community disease control and prevention, which is also part of the agenda plan, we on top of all game with this, we are the home isolation unit, we are the contact tracing departments, and all that is part of the plan. Infection control, we did very well in terms of the wash stations we all over the country. In terms of making masks available, we distributed masks to everyone. In terms of providing sanitizers for everyone, and that constitutes the infection control part of our plan. Clinical guidelines, we have we set up a group of consultants who are helping us to manage our patients in Portsmouth, which we did very well and we were great assistance to that. And obviously, risk communication is very important in our plan to manage the pandemic, whether it's the health promotion unit in terms of the messaging, in terms of the, the celebrities, we got to give the messages in the public, so the PSAs, also the radios, the press briefing. So it was a very comprehensive plan here and we followed it step by step in a very pragmatic way. And that is why we achieve such success. We follow the plan, and it's WHO power approved, and that is why we cannot go for this success that we have today. And of course, with um, school, we, we, we had a pilot uh, a few years ago. The pilot has worked, um, and then come after Easter, everyone will go to school every day of the week, and, and so forth. And likewise, investigators and so forth. Definitely. Excellent. No, but but uh, I, I know you've been very vocal on. Uh, speaking about the need to adhere to, to the safety measures despite the lifting of, of restrictions. Um, many people are likely to believe though um, the threat of COVID-19 is no longer because no longer with us because we have relaxed protocols. So people have said um, no more COVID, no more restrictions. We, 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 we back how it was um, uh, prior to 2020. Uh, why is it important though for us as a country uh, to remain vigilant? Well, Jim, let me make it abundantly clear. The relaxation of the COVID-19 and all these relaxed, all these restrictions that relaxed, we didn't just do it out of the blues. We we had we had to get the data. So presently 56% of our population, the eligible population vaccination that was be vaccinated. And let alone that, the positivity rate has actually dropped to about 2%, 2% just about 2%. Initially, in the surge, we were about 6%, 8% the positivity rate, but now that we dropped. And it's not because that we're testing less people. We're still going, for instance, at the stadium yesterday, 
ingested 270 people annually, or 7%. So it's all positively dropping our vaccination number. You know, that is why we have to relax and remove some of the restrictions on all of these measures. But coming back to your point of we having to be vigilant and continue, as I said earlier, we never know what variant might come up. So it's not just about you and um, you think you can handle COVID. You have to consider the other vulnerable people, you have to consider the children, you have to consider other people. So we still must be vigilant, we still must continue to follow the guidelines that you set. I mean, how much does it cost you to just wear a mask when you're supposed to just to sanitize your hands? And just to, to be careful, as we mentioned earlier. So I still want the public to follow all these little minor guidelines with remote restrictions, but the guidelines are there for you. And sanitizing your hands really doesn't hurt you. It's actually very good to decide in fact of preventing COVID-19. Wearing a mask also protects you, protects your vulnerable friends and neighbors and loved ones. So here yeah, we must continue. We must continue. Certainly, certainly. Um, of yes, in February we successfully hosted special events under very strict COVID-19 guidelines and protocols. These protocols will still apply for certain events. Uh, events catering for over 300 patrons. Can you explain this distinction further? So PM, the special events are going on in February, they were all capped at 500. So any event um, with more than 100 patrons and up to a maximum of 500, had to apply for permission through the Special Events Task Force. In addition to that, the entry requirements to those events require proof of vaccination as well as um, the negative antigen test result from a swab taken the day before. Importantly, there are two important differences with these new protocols. Firstly, only events of more than 300 patients will require um, the permit from the Special Events Task Force. And additionally, um, for entry into entertainment and special events, you can either submit your vaccination card or your negative antigen result from a swab taken 24 hours um, before entry is required. So for all private parties, sporting events, weddings, and nightclubs, nightclubs catering to less than 300 persons are prone to no longer required. When you don't know the place where people like the effects, does it, most persons come on Facebook is a long time. Um, what's next? You know, so um, you know, people are happy, quote unquote, the country has been freed up, you know, um, for the country. So, no, no. so um, what are the activities we have planned? Because I understand we have several activities planned uh, for this month. Yes, PM. It seems like our entertainment and events pillar will certainly be revolved very quickly, and other persons will have to be just waiting for that announcement for them to start posting. At the DFCO, which is well cut out for us, um, you would know that we just wrapped up a few um, small praise and worship sessions with gospel singer Sinash, who was here celebrating her birthday. And for the month of April, the, the focus will be on fitness in nature. Um, the Honorable Dennis Charles has actually coined our tagline for fitness in nature, inviting persons to come and get fit in Dominica, the largest outdoor gym. And so we are gearing up for the fitness challenge later on in the month. Will, which will invite persons to come to Dominica to hike several um, segments of the White Pavilion National Trail. We're planning a series of outdoor activities at our major tourism sites, such as cardio jams, yoga, um, bodybuilding, and hikes. Um, the launch of this fitness month will be on Saturday, and I think the Honorable um, Minister for Health has already confirmed his attendance to come and do a cardio jam at the Chapalco Falls. And PM, of course, you're invited to join us next weekend at Freshwater. Um, from May, we're gearing up for the resumption of the Sheridan and the Eastern Flower Show. The main event will be in November. Um, however, we're going to do a little taste with an enchanted garden party at the Flower Show site. We have been having discussions with um, Creole Heartbeat and Creole Tours Movement uh, for the hosting of the Cadas Festival in the summer. And that will be targeting our French nationals, our French visitors, who make up about 40% of our state visitors. And we're also looking at other activities, especially culinary festivals, perhaps a meal on the beach um, during the summer. And all of these activities are here at, you know, really some resumption of the entertainment industry. And of course, inviting them, persons to the to enjoy these festivities with us. Yeah, that's, I just want to tell you, Mr. Tourism, there's a place in Dominica called Opac. Yes. Um, we have, you know, it's a wonderful scenic spot. And then we can do any kind of activities there, you know, so. 
and then also there's a small village called Tibo. A huge spring here we have a sandwich on the beach there. And also one of the most wonderful places you can have entertainment that you would miss on anybody. Uh, it was close to the coastal prayer, the only one in the Caribbean. Um, so, so these are areas too that are interesting. <laughs> no, so, so what about um, uh, jazz? Yeah. Well, right now, I'm hoping that everybody has a uh, lack of gate of new place for the consumption of jazz and creole, and everybody has been getting their outfits um, and the little nature and chic. Because uh, this special return of jazz, uh, we're looking at special events that will really highlight really the flavor of Dominica. We're looking at a lineup that will have something for everybody, regardless of your generation. And importantly, looking at what will be accommodations in the north to develop weekend packages. So we're expanding the jazz and creole beyond one day and into it being a, a weekend festival where you can have activities, entertainment, and great food, great time from um, Mario Bay in the north. As we get closer to the gate, we will be providing greater details for them. And of course, we are planning for Creole Festival. We are planning for Creole Festival. Um, the intention is to hear from all of our uh, patrons and Dominicans living abroad and festival lovers as to who they want to see on the line. So we will be launching a survey so that persons can chime in and let us know who they will be coming to, to see on that main stage. Okay, so, Dr. Mark, um, question the folks are asking. Um, is whether the Ministry of Health will continue uh, with its monitoring of um, events uh, to ensure that the protocols are ahead. So, so yeah. There are still protocols for events. Definitely, right? definitely. We do have protocols for the special event, as Piers Van already mentioned. But um, what we have to appreciate here is that the, the collaboration between both the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Tourism in terms of the event being planned, but some of the aspects in terms of monitoring, the Ministry of Health would have to play an integral part in this. So for instance, if one of the requirements is a vaccination, so then how do we validate and make sure that this is a correct vaccination program? And later we get to the uh, digital vaccination program. And in terms of the testing, how do we make sure that this is a valid test? So the Ministry of Health is responsible for validating both the test and also for validation of the vaccination. Our environmental health department is very instrumental in terms of where we have the sanitizers, which sanitizers we have, and um, so that the patrons of whichever event it is, whenever they, if they go to the washrooms or on an entrance, there is sanitization. In terms of monitoring of the mask, we also have to make sure that the mask is there. So we at every step of it, whether it's vaccination point of view, whether it's the testing point of view, whether it's the sanitization, whether it's the mask wear. We are an integral part of all the monitoring for these special events. So we work in collaboration with the structure to do it together. Yeah, and so it's so very important that the organizers of those events and those patrons are here to those protocols. Correct. Yeah. Because um, the success of the loose from the restrictions rests with you. Definitely. Um, and ensure that they really play a part of it and just has to be a societal response. Because um, anything can happen. Right. We want to ensure that. That, that we continue on this positive trend that we are having. So I urge all of us to play our part. You know, we can't be indifferent to the fact that we, we do have COVID-19 around. And the last thing we want is to have a siege and then go back to those, to those restrictions that we really do not be part of. Now, as we wind down, um, can you update us though on some of the recent successes we have been having in the Ministry of Tourism? American Airlines um, is scheduled to begin daily flights from April 4, and we continue to see almost daily calls uh, by the cruise ships. So, so there are a lot of positive things happening in, in tourism. Looking like it here, we want to start off with the launch of our new logo for Dominica, the destination Dominica, and it certainly allows Dominica to stand boldly on the worldwide stage and highlights our unique features, and of course, reinforces the distinction between Dominica and the Dominican Republic. Um, with that, we have been embarking on an aggressive campaign, especially in the U.S. Uh, many of you have seen the examples of the huge billboards that were placed in Miami. And just for that campaign only, we have seen an increase in the book a trip click rate on our website, an increase of 48%. When we compare that to last year, we are actually seeing an increase of 750% just for that um, based on that campaign. In terms of the AA flights, they have been performing very well. Most of them, on average, loads at about 
Um, during Christmas and New Year's season, it even surpassed at 75%. And for February, we're seeing an increase of over 300 um, based on the previous season of overall arrivals. For the cruise sector, since the opening of the official cruise season in October, we have seen 160 cruise calls, and that has translated in about 57,000 persons disembarking and enjoying tours to our iconic sites. Um, now, although there has been an increase in the number of calls, we are now slowly regaining um, our numbers of 2019 because they are operating at half capacity. The closest we got to that was actually in December when we noticed 33,000 persons, which came very close to our 2019 figure of 37,000. So we are slowly getting back there. Um, in terms of the yachts, they are also returning, um, especially for the past few weeks. And the accommodations, and as I mentioned before, especially the dive sector, has really been um, reporting um, major increases in terms of bookings. Let's continue to build on those successes. Um, Dr. Cordy, any of this you wish to share with us, with the public? Um, we help this concern. Um, Kim, we have um, there are quite a few things going on with the Ministry of Health. Um, first of all, next week we'll actually be launching our digital COVID 19 vaccination cards because sometimes some of, um, some of the people who got vaccinated here and they travel elsewhere. Um, what really the trend that the world is going is to have the digital COVID 19 vaccination card. So next week we'll be launching that to make things much easier for our citizens who have vaccination there who travel abroad. And um, that's a big thing for us. We launch it next week. In terms of COVID, also we've actually closed down our COVID care complex in Portsmouth, and um, and that's because of the fewer cases that we had, minimal cases. So we really don't need Portsmouth anymore. We can hand it to the China French Hospital, which is good for us in the sense that that just shows how well we've managed and we brought down our cases, even our active cases, and. Um, our deaths have been the same, so we can comfortably move back to Dominica China and Chief Hospital since Portsmouth is no longer necessary at this point in time. Even also, presently, our baby friend, the hospital initiative that is ongoing, and we're going to get recertification for that as well. And um, recently, Cabinet also approved of the National Disaster Management Multi Hazard Plan for Health for Dominica. And since we just in the pandemic, in the COVID pandemic, that is of significance to us because that's going to help us plan even better. God forbid, when it's all there to be some other pandemic, this is also an integral part of the planning process of how we manage future pandemics. So that's very important for us. And we also adopted, adopted the Health Emergency Operations Center concept of operations for that as well. And all that's done together in WHO and PAHO. So these are very important for us. In terms of structures, well, over New Marigold Hospital, um, the structure is complete. And I spoke to the um, the suppliers yesterday and our equipment has been shipped so very soon maybe in the next month or so all our shipment should be there and then in the next few months before the end of the year for sure we should be opening our marriage hospital which is good news for the people in the north eastern part but generally for us in our vehicle and um, as you know it's a full um fully equipped hospital or operating theater or imaging department or dialysis and um, and it, it's uh it's something that we should be proud about let alone that in terms of the brand of um, Stratford, I Brenda Stratford Foundation Eye Center will be launching it on the 12th of May. So, and that's going to be a center of excellence because the intention is that we can even have um, patients from other OECS countries coming to Dominica for their eye surgeries here. We've spent almost a million dollars in equipment, state of the art equipment for that particular um, eye um, center. And we really look forward to this, which will be starting on the 12th of May. Recently, we just completed training of a high beam machine. We had Professor Zhang, world renowned Professor Zhang from the People's Republic of China, who was here. We trained four of our surgeons to use the high beam machine, and actually, one of his colleagues uh, who remained behind to continue training for the other, the fourth of our surgeons that we trained initially. And um, that says a lot for us, as you know, here in the high beam machine, where there are just too many Latin Central and South American here, and, um, and the Caribbean as well. So that, that speaks a lot for us. And, um, all our health centers, we recently we just um, commissioned, well, not commissioned, but fully functional. It had, initially, we did seven, but now we just have another five, we went up to 12. So, Penville and the Neutron and Balakel are fully functional now. And Sufre, we just waiting for some equipment for Sufre. Sansova is 60% complete in terms of renovation and grant for going to the design stage. But we should look forward to a brand new health center for our capital city, also, city regional center. And uh, we're in the design phase. All we're doing now is just trying to get relocation of the services so that we can move forward. In terms of St. Joseph, we found a location for the St. Joseph Health Center, 
and um, we designed that real quick as well. Servant I well on the way, the foundation is complete, I'm just preparing for the columns on the floor. So in terms of structural aspect, a lot going on in terms of policy aspects of health, a lot of is going on in terms of just the general management of things. And this week also came, we also brought back most of the testing to the primary health care department. Um, a lot of it was done from a central point of view, but when we put it back into the district, so primary health will take part of their testing and all of their isolations and stuff. So it, it's a lot going on. I think we're getting back to where we want to be so we can focus on the other um, chronic non chronical diseases, which is really an issue for us. So we're just getting prepared for that next stage in health. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, uh, any closing remarks? Oh, yes. Well, TM, I'd just like to um, thank you for your continuous um, support and confidence that you continue to put in the tourism sector um, as we battle through this pandemic. And we also want to express our appreciation for the Minister for Health and your team. Um, throughout the past two years, it has really been a partnership based on mutual trust um, between tourism and mutual health. So we want to certainly express our appreciation. Of course, our minister and Parsec continue to be steadfast in terms of the fight against COVID-19, but again, easing as we move towards um, welcoming more persons into Dominica. And the same goes for our teams at this government of the authority, that's the Ministry of Tourism. I especially want to recognize our stakeholders who throughout the past two years, they have really been really committed um, to the sector as we continue to build a world-class sustainable tourism destination. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I want to commend you as a PSA for your, your, your commitment to your task. I don't give much of free, it's certainly not important, uh, but um, you know, you've been a living a fantastic job with young person, I think. Um, a lot of young people in particular who can with your diligence to hard work and yeah. college to work. So I'm very grateful for this. Um, Dr. Mark, any, any final thoughts? Uh, well, yeah, in conclusion, I really want to um, thank our staff, the Ministry of Health, and all the other frontline workers, not just the health frontline workers, but all the other departments, whether it's fire and ambulance, whether it's police, whether it's customs and excise, everyone played a part um, in our fight. Well, our continuing fight against COVID 19. So, I really want to thank them and um, they made a lot of sacrifices and we appreciate that very much. The public played a very important part and they still continue and we are asking them to continue playing that part in terms of the health protocols and um, which has brought us where we are today. And um, But important thing, okay, which is really a comprehensive, defensive mechanism we put up as a government. So, whether it's tourism, whether it's health, whether it's communication and works, whether it's just the whole digitalization of all the different activities and functions. I think everything will come um, because we did it together and we had a good plan and we're very pragmatic in our plan. So I just want the people to stay focused. Let's adhere to the simple little protocols of wearing all masks, sanitizing our hands, and just be responsive. It's a matter of personal responsibility. We all have to play our part so that we can continue to fight the fight for the Thank you very much, Ibo Ifun, our Minister for Health, Dr. Moritai, and our PS of Tourism. I'm a fan of our parents and the party and providing the public with uh, clarifications and, and, and updates on what we're doing um, vis a vis our response to COVID 19. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is definitely the way so we can make it so things can go back to normal, you know? I feel that getting vaccinated is something that's necessary for us to go back to normal like all things were before and I'm excited to be uh, like one of the first people to get a new vaccine. I'm a little nervous, but kind of excited at the same time. I'm going to take my COVID-19 vaccine. How do you feel about that? I'm a little nervous, but I'm excited. <laughs> because I don't like infection. I don't want to get COVID, so I'm really happy to take the other vaccine. And I want everybody else to take the vaccine because I'm important. This past Monday, the Ministry of Public Works, in collaboration with the Ministry of Education, Launched an architect competition to involve local professionals in the design of a new main library for Dominique. The new library holds great historical and cultural significance for Dominique, and we certainly look forward to the designs, 
which will be for coming from our talented local architects. The competition will give the architects the opportunity to make a lasting contribution to the architectural heritage and landscape of Lamine. I've invited two top officials from the Ministry of Public Works to speak in greater detail about this initiative. Honorable Cassidy Laville, our Minister for Public Works and the Digital Economy, and Mr. Emma Lansford, our Chief Technical Officer in the Ministry of Public Works and the Digital Economy, um, who are here with us and on the panel. I to welcome you both, our Minister and uh, Emma Lansford and Mr. Lansford. Uh, thank you for, for being here with us. Now, let's get straight into the discussion there, uh, Honorable Laville. The Government of Amigal has launched an architect competition as we proceed with plans uh, to commence work on a new modern national library uh, this year. Uh, can you speak to us about the general objectives of this competition and why it has been uh, extended to local um, professionals? Certainly, uh, greetings to you, greetings to all the listeners. And um, certainly this is a fantastic opportunity for all of us in Dominica. Uh, you have done certainly well in explaining the historic and cultural significance of this new library. And um, we believe that a project of that significance should entail as much opinion stemming from the public. And this provides us an opportunity to incorporate the perspectives and the views from the public uh, through the design concepts that the architects will be presenting to us. This affords us also the opportunity to encounter these architects in a more personal and professional way by way of being exposed to their skill sets, their, their talents, their, 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 their capabilities by way of the presentation of the drawings and the concepts. Uh, we also believe that uh, we must focus on the people and um, this government is certainly about this. We know that our architects have the talent they have the various skill sets, and uh, this architecture comp co competition will certainly give them the opportunity to spark a uh, uh, fire, I would say, uh, in, in the professional capacities. Uh, so we are certainly excited about that, and this will also give them an opportunity to be rewarded as well. Whereas this is not the focus, it is certainly something that will be absolutely uh, important to them. Thank you very much. Um, you know, so, 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 what are the general features of, uh, of, of the new library uh, which are expected uh, to be included in any design? The returning honorable point is that thank you for having us here um, to be part of this movement and exciting initiative. Um, historically, public libraries have been um, where you have a wide collection of literary. Um, Arts and um, books, different form of books. Um, but in the modern libraries, we not only cater to the education and literary arts, but also the cultural expressions. And so some of the features of the new library will include an innovation hall, um, cultural and learning spaces, meeting spaces, um, exhibition spaces, also cafeteria, cafes, um, recreational areas. Um, and also will still be providing for the traditional functions of the library where you have the collection spaces and you have the readers, the sitting areas for readers and obviously for the function properly that will adequately provide for the staff and we also have to have washroom facilities and storage spaces and, and, and space for archives. So these are some of the main features that we expect to be included. In the new national library. Thank you. No, well, what is the time window? Okay, the, the competition. Yeah. The, so the competition um, started on March 24, and the closing date for submissions is May 4. Following that closing date, there will be a period for review of the submissions, which will end on on May 8. So we expect to have reviewed this this submission by May 8 and then be able to announce the results of the competition by May 4th. Now, no, from a professional standpoint, is that sufficient time? Well, I think it is, and I'll explain why. Um, 
the, the competition, what we require out of the competition is the production of schematic designs, not fully developed designs, not, not construction designs. So these schematic designs will include the floor plans, four elevations, 3D renderings, and it's also optional that the competitors may present um, 3D animated um, presentation of their, of their, their proposals or, or submissions. Um, so that period, in my opinion, is sufficient to give, the, the, uh, to give us a good submission on schema, towards schematic design. Now, the folks on Facebook are asking here, um, they're asking what happens at the end of this um, of the submission period. And you know, the question they're asking is, um, who reviews the designs? Okay, um, the, the, there's a, a review, proposed review committee, uh, which will comprise of the, um, the chief librarian, um, also the chief municipal planner, an architect from the Ministry of Public Works, the chief technical officer of the Ministry of Tourism, the uh, our local historian. We also have. We also intend to have a representative of the DAIC and yours truly the Chief Technical Officer of the Ministry of Public Works. Okay. So it's a, it's a broad engagement here. Yeah. 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 Since the passage of Hurricane Maria, we have become more conscious of the need to build stronger and better. Will this consideration feature in the judging criteria uh, for the new building? Well, absolutely, Pian, uh, we will certainly consider that uh, since Hurricane Maria, uh, you have actually said it clearer uh, than anyone else uh, that we need to build resilience and that is the way we will achieve what I now call Nico. And that announcement has certainly been mandated um, and it's been written into our policy agenda. And we have seen that by way of the NRDS, the CRLP, and so on. And it is certainly something that will be part of the judging criteria. Even earlier this week, um, cabinets approved the new building codes and that will also be considered as part of the new designs for the library. So, so in, in respect to the general rules and, and, and criteria and condition, can you give us some details on this? Okay. Um, First of all, let me just mention the eligibility criteria, okay, which is um, pretty simple. It is open to, to documents or foreign to the Qualified architects practicing local. Um, the architects who submit, they um, have to make sure they submit the relevant documents as stipulated in the, on the registration form. Um, this submission has to include um, the drawings, the already outline uh, on Eight and a half by eleven, which is like letter size, a four format. Um, if they present larger, which are eleven by seventeen, they should fold that into to come back down to the size of, of, of the paper form, paper format. Um, they have to provide a narrative of the concept. And as I mentioned before, the drawings have been good site plan, floor plans, four elevations, 3D rendered drawings, and the option of Presenting and meeting, um, rendering of all of, of this also there. Um, the, 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 the evaluation criteria will include sustainability or the consideration of the sustainability of the design to the competition brief, or the suitability rather of the design to the competition brief, spatial integration, the functionality of the design solution, innovation and originality of the design solution form of the of the structure and environmental considerations taken into consideration into, into the effect on the design and the the um, conformity to reality of the site and so on. Um, so these are the the, the the evaluation criteria that we use to come to the conclusion of to the best presentation. So on in respect to the design um, have we impressed on the participants, the need to, to provide designs which stay true to our history and heritage. 
I mean, we have here and um, the city units, the last of them, expressed uh, some of their reconsiderations in the design brief, um, even in the launch. Um, but it is something that we continue to continue to impress um, on the participants. Because here in the only village is we have a rich culture, we have rich history, and um, we must stay true to that at the very core. We, we should not be broken, but we parted from that. And um, we must also understand the present day realities. And um, we have issues with land availability, we have issues with uh, major storms, even with increased uh, ferocity. So with that being the case, we, we must juxtapose um, the historic and cultural significance against the present day lived realities and, and to justify uh, sustainable designs for the future. Uh, we believe, notwithstanding, that the architects here in Dominic could have the talents, the capabilities to resolve that, that enigma without compromising any. Uh, we believe that we understand the, the the built environment, they understand the local materials for consideration, and um, we believe that they will do a, a great job in, in balancing the two, the history and culture versus the innovation. So that was a very good way to put it. I agree with it entirely. Uh, we begin to see more of the inclusive approach of, of, uh, of the design of landmark project in America. So is this a broader policy initiative for environment or is this a, a, a one-time thing? <laughs> <laughs> as as Dominica would say, it is a cool wash. <laughs> yeah, it is not a cool wash. It's a cool wash. Uh, neither is it uh, too short, too flat. Yes. Um, as you would have it in for many projects within the government system and framework, you would have it being led by a particular ministry and to be clear. Um, in this particular project, uh, the public would see that the, the lines are actually good. We don't know if it's public works, we don't know if it's, uh, if it's education, if it's tourism, culture, you do not know. But we have identified for this project particularly, there are so many people and interest groups um, who have made themselves available to give an input and perspective. And um, I know for sure that with discussions with the Ministry of Tourism, for example, they are looking at this as pilot project and they, they will very likely adopt this approach to developing some of your right. eco tourism. They have to because you know we have issues that I think I have a serious issue with the facilities at Titi Gosh. You know, we need to get local architects to give us some concepts mm -hmm. for Titi Gosh and, and even have a pool to have it redesigned. It, it's too dark and dreary, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and we need to bring some, some light and Use local plants in the area to landscape the areas and to give a better experience. And so I don't think we can continue going places where we are not fighting. So it's a, it's a broader. A broader. Absolutely. The other thing I, I like to see government, uh, of course, you are know, part of, of this cabinet of committee that we are seeing this, is to look at landscaping as well. Mm -hmm. We need to get into landscaping, especially for the public transportation. You know, I thought you did the airport people for many years, eventually they, um, they followed my, my guidance and, and we can see the experience of driving to the airport, you know, um, with all the plants on either side of the road, you know, and it makes a huge difference and I would like to see the same thing happen on the west coast or on the, the, the airport to Rose or in, in the city itself and so forth. So I would like to, us to, to really get the, the, the landscape artists to come up with some concepts and have it irrigated. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So let us go. Then I think it's important for young people to get involved and wider the community to get involved in the whole process of determining what they want. Because once you go and put studies there, oh, I don't like that. I want, I want this one. So now we have an opportunity to, to design what you like uh, or, or what you would like. And, and, and so I really want to come and put in the efforts on that. So, so it's not, a, it's not a cool watch. It's no, part of a broader um, policy, not. policy initiative. Which is cool, which is the first of many. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, uh, and, 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 and is this part of the government's approach to, to the efforts to engage more of our young people in, in national development efforts? Absolutely. I, you know, 
I mean, look at it. Here I am. That is still on Amboy. I feel that I'm talking to the Prime Minister, the leader of a very progressive country, asking me questions, listening to my perspectives as a young person. And this certainly shows the interest of this government, and not just the interest, uh, but the fact that uh, after it has been proclaimed that young people will be involved in national development um, agenda. Um, here it is that I am here, and I'm the first uh, one of just many uh, participating in this. So I am certainly very humbled by, by the invitation here. Here it is, we had youth parliament recently, and you would see the support that's given uh, by the government in this parliament to support of these young people to facilitate uh, training, to just give motivation, encouragement, and just sh merely show up. Uh, this shows the interest of this government uh, to incorporate the youth and the, the opinions of the young people um, in, in discussions on development. And I, I believe uh, competitions like this one, this architecture competition, is one that certainly encourages that and fosters that. Because when I recall when we were discussing the approach to this competition, when we looked at various models adopted in different countries, you would see that many of the architecture competitions were very restricted. I mean, you would have to be uh, easily over 60 to get your foot in that door. And here it is, we had to create a, a, a competition with, uh, with rules and uh, requirements that would be would create opportunities for young people. And this is what we did to allow them to get their foot in the door. And uh, this certainly is, is really, truly the next step of the power revolution. First start the different education revolution for the young people who otherwise would have never had a chance to go to study. And here it is, you have people who study engineering, architecture, and so on. They're now back and the government is ensuring or mandating that um, there are opportunities for them for participation in projects like these. That is certainly something I'm proud to be part of. Thank you, Rex. No, any other, is there any updates you wish to share with us? Any yeah. major for the works? Well, yeah, I, I think we, in the city of is here, we probably need another segment <laughs> to discuss all of the updates, but um, by way of a few, we have a few ongoing projects. The live bridge, as we know, uh, it is basically complete. Um, we have done uh, a great job, I would say, on this project, and, um, and restoring the access in, in this area. Um, all that is left right now is painting of some elements, and it's merely for aesthetics. Uh, the painting and signage is in place so it is safe to travel to this region. The reason we have agreed to open and create access. In this area, we also have the Live East project, which is the $12 million project. And it is going well. Uh, this covers the fourth one, the wood section. We have another, a few other new projects, even in this area. Here in Roseau, you would see that the retaining wall has come in to protect the riverside apartments. And that is something that we certainly welcome. Um, as we are retaining walls, we, we have commenced in, 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 in Hollywood also. And um, it's one of many. We completed one sometime last year, and we're using a local contractor in that area to, to complete this work. We have works ongoing in the area of Cocteau, and this is in the final stages now. Uh, we also have uh, some tender project, tender and valuation um, projects. Um, we have Sufria Wall, which is in the final stages of evaluation. We have the rehabilitation of Virginia as well. In the pipeline and um, also in digital economy, there are many good things. Over the weekend, here we launched Work Online Young Maker 3, where uh, 60 young people who have been given the opportunity also to be part of that training. And um, we certainly welcome that. We are in the final stages also of recruiting a grants manager and training coordinator because in digital economy, we have done uh, this year digital skills and technology adoption. And as part of that, 
we expect them to roll out some grand opportunities and potential opportunities for our professionals and young people, businesses here in London. And that being the case, uh, here comes this, the, the grants manager to, to be part of administering that entire process for us. So there are many things I'm going on. Now we also did a, we started a series, um, it's a virtual series, um, in the first instance for various businesses involved in digital economy to display their, 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 their projects, their products, and, and the online platforms and to teach people to navigate through their platforms as to how to use it, how to access and utilize the services or the videos online and so on. So it's really exciting times for our ministry of health. Thank you very much, Amanda. So I'm going to need final thoughts. Yeah. Uh, we live in very interesting and exciting times um, with all of the infrastructure development that's taking place in the country. Um, I think it's, it's more than we've seen um, in this period of time, more than we've seen in, in, in our past history. And our, this, this competition actually gives our professionals an opportunity, uh, yet another opportunity to, to contribute um, to this, this um, exciting development of our country and so i really want to encourage as many of them as possible to take part in this competition and that way they will get the opportunity to um we talk about history but tomorrow's history is today's present and so if they what, what they what they do today will form part of our history down the road and so they get it's an opportunity that we take advantage of to actually be part and document the part of our history because a library building is usually a, a national monument and so that opportunity is a, a very unique opportunity that i really would like to see as many people take part in and i really encourage them to do so and i wish all participants good luck thank you thank you, any final thoughts? Yes, um, thank you Pian. Uh, I, I just wish to express my, my gratitude for this meeting invitation to be able to discuss with you and people from Nico. And to also say that I'm proud to be part of this government, of this family of leadership by example. I'm also happy to have the pleasure and privilege to work with hardworking visionary people like uh, Mr. Lansford, who is CTO of the hardworking staff. And they've done an excellent job to shape the infrastructure of land shape landscape here in Dominica. And I also wish to encourage young people right now to embrace the opportunities that they for the with right now, the areas of STEM particularly. I think um, they are wonderful opportunities for them, and I um, encourage them to study fields in engineering, science, uh, and, and medicine, because um, they have the opportunities to study and to attain the highest level of education. And not only that, but the environment is created here in Long Beach to return to add value to our country and to its development. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it could continue to be young the time that uh, in this country, other development, you know, we going to invest heavily on initiatives and programs and um, put forth policies um, all about empowering young people. It's very up to the young people to take advantage of these opportunities. Uh, as you indicated earlier, we started through the education revolution uh, because we recognize our country to have the for people on education. You know, no access to education. And uh, not only access, but the means of taking advantage of the access. And so the question is, what do we do for education? Are we going to complain or are we going to, um, you know, produce um, out of the knowledge that we have acquired um, by doing a degree or two? So it's an opportunity, and I want to thank um, Honorable Minister Rabil and also Mr. Lanzo for being here. Earlier we had Dr. Mamitai, our Minister of Health, and PS Valor, and the PS of Tourism. Uh, discussing the, the lifting up of so many of the COVID-19 related restrictions. This is all country to build. Um, we have now controlling shares in government, as I indicated. Um, this is correcting our historical wrong. And I want to ensure that um, that that this has a change. And certainly under this level of it a change. We believe in fundamental position that utilities such as water and electricity should always remain in national control um, for, for a number of reasons. And, I, and I'm very happy to have seen the positive 
overwhelming reaction uh, to this um, decision. Now, it is left to us as non citizens to ensure and to assure the success of, of government. And, uh, the management will, be, will remain in place. I have identified a chairman, um, so the chairman, and that person will be Mr. Patrick Pemberton. He is a bit to serve. Mr. Pat Patrick Pemberton comes with a Many, many decades of experience, and I have no doubt um, that he will continue to give his best and, and, and bring to bear his, his knowledge and his skills and experience um, to continue my my job. As always, uh, has been the case as far as the for the last 18 years. I don't get involved in digital management or any state entity. I only get involved when people come here or complain about the services that the businesses are trying to provide me because I have a duty. First and foremost, the people don't have to. And if you complain, I have to listen. And I have to um, seek to intervene to correct whatever um, challenge they have identified. And so the same thing will be done. And we have also agreed to retain the management structure and also the general manager, the person of Mrs. McKenzie, who I have the, the highest um, uh, professional consideration for and respect. And I have no doubt that she will continue. Uh, to manage the affairs of government in the way that she has done for the world. So many years, especially during difficult times, post um, Maria, for example, her efforts and her leadership um, was exemplary. So let us go forth, my dear friends. The exciting things are happening, but we're standing COVID 19. Um, it is left to us to work together. You know, there will always be differences, but can we not negotiate just this difference? You know, and, and, and to look at the bigger picture, commit to ourselves to dominate. You know, and we have gone through so much over the last two years with COVID-19. And there is a, there's a sense of profound hope uh, for the future. But we can never sit back and say there's hope. We have to work towards achieving um, our desired objectives. And those joint forces we got to make things happen. And do have a pride um, in controlling share of the dominant in the most difficult period. In the most difficult period. It speaks to the prudent management of the affairs of this country. Um, that in, a, in the most difficult period, we have been able to find the resources, to, to mobilize the resources to acquire you know, control issues. Um, so it's, it's been an extraordinary effort. Um, and this, and I want to publicly recognize the efforts of Dr. Henderson, who, are, who had assigned the responsibility over a year ago um, to, to lead our process. Um, to, 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 to acquire the country and change the government, and also to our Finance Secretary, um, who's going to help us. So, thank you very much, my friends. Let us go forth and serve our God and country. Let us not look at the glass up. Let's look at the glass half full. Because in all things, we must be friends. We will not give up, we will not take it away. Let's be easy in that way. It's written. So, what do we have? Thank God. If we don't have, we thank God. And Little that we have, we have to be grateful for it. It is always somebody next door who may not have anything and who doesn't complain. And if we complain about what we have, we, there's a very good chance we may not get more of what we want. Thank you, God bless you, and let us remain committed to our country. Thank you, and always happy to be here with you on on Pali. The next Sunday, I am coming back here to dedicate it completely to you. And where the entire one hour will be questioned. I will say nothing. But what I will start from there, from, from first minute uh, answering questions from you and hearing from you your suggestions, your ideas, your aspirations, your dreams, your fears, your concerns, um, and see how we can find responses and solutions to those. Thank you.